this poem that unless you were there or at the Academy Cemetery yesterday, you've probably never heard. I want to give this to you for your collection. It was in the days of the revolution on campus here when the fascists took over and padlocked the English department and accused the English department of all manner of arson. And Peter wrote this poem, his confession, and mimeoed it and put it in the little mailboxes <laughs> of the department. And so, of course, everybody else in the department had to follow suit, which they did. And uh, by some fluke, I came upon them and had them published by a friend of mine who was learning printing. <laughs> FSC arson poems. <laughs> There's great lines in here and also the funny side of Peter. Hearing that he has been named by an anonymous informant on a secret tape as a conspirator against the administration, Everwine confesses everything. <laughs> and speaking of Kit Smart, for in this year of our Lord 1970, I know the jig is up, for you have found me out at last, for on that dark night you saw me with books of poems in my arms, I secretly was on my way to meet the Marx Brothers, <laughs> for we conspired together for we burned the music department's piano and laughed over the quiet ashes of Mozart. <laughs> For later, I hid out in the secret places of Harpo's hair. For it was I who dumped cement down the union toilets. For I wanted vengeance against the dirty throats of America. For I wanted vengeance against James Fikes, who spies on me in the urinals of the administration building. <laughs> For it was I who smuggled those brown rocks over the borders of Mexico, hiding them in plain wrappers of Aztec poems. For I used them to bust the library windows, for I was possessed of many useless books. For I was thinking of Philip Walker, for they were the color of shit, and it is evil to retain shit. And though I have a bad karma made visible as a bald spot, I am a poet with long hair and madder than most. For I have the gift of tongues, thank God, and he directed me to whisper bomb threats into the gun barrel of the president's bodyguard. For Carl Falk appeared to me in a vision, dressed as the Bank of America, but would not grant me a credit card. For I have perverted the sweet minds of my students. For I look up the girls' dresses at every opportunity. For I do not hate enough the subsequent erection, despite the good advice of Oren Wardle. For I cannot easily say yes, though it is the holy password into the inner sanctum. For I have resisted the key that belongs to Norman Baxter. <laughs> for a man is known by his friends, but my friends have no talent for eating unwholesome objects. For it is the duty of the poet to write, and my hands made an outcry on the walls of public buildings. For I spoke out for Robert Mezzi, whose hair is a cloud of fragrance. <laughs> for I am a friend of the messenger, who is madder than I am, and a Zionist of truthful language. For I bless Kit Smart, who taught me this, for I will not go away quietly. <laughs> was quite marvelous. Um, I think I have the distinction of having known Peter for the very shortest number of years. I'm Catherine Hodges. Uh, I teach English down at Porterville College and I met Peter in 2015 about the time he was uh, gracious enough to, um, to write a blurb for my first book. 
Um, I, this morning I was rereading Collecting the Animals and I, I came on something um, in the Aztec poems that seemed like the right thing to read today. And I'm, I'm pardon my pronunciation. Two poems by Ayokwan Quetzalcin, and it is the second of two poems. <coughs> we live in the country where things go away. Is it like this in that country the dead wander? Are some happy there among old friends? Or is it here only that passing a face, we look into it and speak its name? It, it strikes me that, well, I'll say, I, I knew Peter's poems for many years before I, I knew Peter himself, and it strikes me that um, one of my experiences with his poems is that I, I feel my name spoken out of those poems. And I, I suspect that many of us have that experience um, with, with his poems. Um, so, and, and I think many of you were probably at the, um, at Peter's remix reading at Tokyo Garden in 2000, Dixie 2017. Um, and it was the release of his beautiful little letterpress chapbook, um, a, a Small Clearing. Um, and, and if you were there, you might remember it was a stormy night. It was wild, it was windy, it was raining. And we drive from, um, my husband Rob and I drive from two hours south to get to Fresno, so it was it was a wild ride just getting here, and then then um, and then walking into this lit space with the warmth and the and the um, and, and lots of lots of commotion. It was its own kind of clearing, and then of course as as Peter began reading, it was it there was this intensity that there always was when he read and we listened, and I think it was Chuck maybe who said that Peter was the consummate listener. But when we, when we heard him read, weren't, weren't, we, weren't we riveted? Um, I'm, t I'm saying that because now I'm gonna break form and actually read a poem of mine um, for Peter. It ends my second book and and it's one that comes out of that experience. I went home and started drafting a poem, and it was it was just insanely full of everything, including the kitchen sink. And I sent it to Chris Buckley when I thought maybe maybe it was approaching done. He said, mm -mm, "Not approaching done, but keep going." So so here it is, um, possibly done. And it's called "One Violet in February" for Peter Everwine. Home from Fresno, I wrote this poem, then took out everything but the violet. Later, a little rain fell back in. There's no story here, only the song of tires on the wet street and me making my way toward the unsayable, dousing my way with syllables, silence, the goodness of friends. I'm not there yet, not even sure I'll know when I get there. I couldn't be happier. This afternoon, um, for all of us, I'm happy and I'm bereft and I'm forever grateful. I'm Jean Jansen, very privileged to be here and to have the opportunity to read 
a poem by Peter Eberwein. I walked into his classroom in 1980. I was 47 years old. I wanted to write the, some hard stories artfully, partly to tell the story of my grandmother who had committed suicide. And the story had not been told till the day after my father died. I knew that that story needed to be told with art. So beginning with, there were many other things to write about, of course, and I found many beautiful things to write about. But I could not have walked into a better place than Peter's class, advanced poetry writing in 1980. I came with Christian faith. I still have Christian faith. And he honored that in me. I want you to know that. He also, I think, had some too, without saying that very often. And um, at least faith in God. He was one who then became a friend for life and looked at my poems graciously until just a few months ago. That same fall, I took classes from Chuck Hanselcheck in modern poetry writing, really uh, modern poets, really important, and Chuck also looked at my work. And then Philip Levine came the next semester, and these three men changed the world. I mean that. But for Peter, I want to read, I was going to read the Hermitage poem because he called me to ask, did I know of a retreat place? And I had heard about that one. So when he wasn't able to stay the whole time, I felt a little bit to blame that it had been a good place for him. But he said, no, never mind, Jean. I got a poem out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and he sure did, didn't he? <laughs> I love this poem, perhaps it's as you say. Perhaps it's as you say that nothing stays lost forever. How many times have I said, no, no, there is a darkness in the cell, and opened my hands to cup emptiness, tasting its bitten face. I do not know if our love survive us, waiting through the long night for our step, or if they will know us then, entering our flesh with the old sigh. I do know, do not know, but I think of fields that stretch away flat beneath the stars, their dry grasses gathering the light of honey. The few houses wink and go out, Across the fields, an asphalt road darkens and disappears among the cottonwoods by the dry creek. It is so quiet, so quiet. Meet me there. Fresnoians, Fresnoians. That has a bit of a beautiful resonance. I don't. I keep people keep forgetting that I have the Fresno connection. I become so strongly associated with Los Angeles. I got to do something about that. Remember, you guys, I'm with Fresno too. Um, do you know? I believe that the very first poetry reading I ever went to, I was. 18, I was a freshman here, and I went to some little place nearby. It had to have been nearby because I didn't have a car, so I had to have walked there, and Peter Everwine was reading. That was the first reading I ever saw. And this fellow, Peter Everwine, was reading these mysterious poems that were both worldly 
and otherworldly. Um, they were made out of the things of this world, but they seem to, Chris, where are you, Chris? Where's Chris? Chris, the poem you read, it had the phrase, Lord of Silence, and it's as if the Lord of Silence suddenly decided to speak, and the Lord of Silence was speaking directly and deeply to Peter Everwine. So I was fascinated by these poems. I'm gonna read one. Now, this is an homage to you, Jean. This is a tribute to your very good taste. Because I have the same taste, so it's gotta be good. <laughs> so I'm gonna read the same poem because I, originally my plan was if somebody else reads the poem I want to read, I'll just read a different poem, but now I realize that I'm so committed to this poem that if I don't read it, I'm just gonna drive three hours home to LA and be frustrated all the way that I didn't get to read it. Um, at this little reading, we're 20, maybe 22, 23 people there. I wanna mention that uh, Peter Everwine also read a poem by Cesar Vallejo. And this poem by Cesar Vallejo was as good as Pete's poem. And the poem by Cesar Vallejo had a few lines. I thought to myself, well, those are just the most beautiful lines of poetry I have ever heard. And then I thought, well, this is the first poetry reading I've ever been to, so I'm sure I'll go to many, many readings in here, much better lines. Of, no, never have I been to a thousand. David, don't you think I've been to about a thousand poetry readings? Someday, a thousand and one, I, I mean, you know, yeah, a, a thousand and, and growing. Um, and these lines, which were as beautiful as Pete's lines, went something like this. If I were not here, some other poor man would be drinking my coffee. I wanna go from door to door and beg forgiveness and bake it like bread in the warm ovens of my heart. I went, oh, damn. <laughs> so, and so although I have never heard any more lines that were better than that, I've heard lines that were as good so many here, Chris. We've got some. We've got some lines, Chris, that are that. David, Chuck, ask, but not better. Don't think. That, I hope this doesn't hurt your feelings. Not better. Um, this this poem has some of that mystery. Some of that Lord of Silence decides to speak. Perhaps it's as you say. Perhaps it's as you say that nothing stays lost forever. How many times have I said, no, no, there's a darkness in the cell, and opened my hands to cup emptiness, tasting its bitten face? I do not know if our love survive us, waiting through the long night for our step, or if they will know us then, entering our flesh with the old sigh I do not know, but I think of fields that stretch away flat beneath the stars, their dry grasses gathering a light of honey. The few houses wink and go out across the fields, an asphalt road darkens and disappears among the cottonwoods by the dry creek. It is so quiet, so quiet. Meet me there. Robert Mezzi, who you mentioned, Bob Mezzi with his hair like an aura of fragrance. A cloud of fragrance. A cloud of fragrance, that's pretty good. <laughs> he, uh, I just spoke to him. He's now situated over in a residence home in Florida. Um, he wants to remind everybody how much he loved Pete and his poetry. They became very close friends when they were in their late teens. And he said to me, that means we have been close friends for 70 years. 
and he was a great admirer and sends his love. John Hales, but I'm going to use this time to read a, a, a story that um, Gabe Bibara, one of uh, Pete's students, who wanted to be here to read it but wasn't able to today. So I'm going to read this for um, Gabe Bibara. Um, I think it, it speaks for a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, students that that uh, that Peter has worked with over the years. So Gabe writes. Um, as I am sure you know, Mr. Everwine impacted and meant so much to make to many in this room and beyond it, and it is no different for me. Mr. Everwine was a regular customer at Drug Fair in the Tower District, and it is there where I was fortunate to know him outside of the classroom, still surrounded by the gift of his words and company. He always asked me how my writing was going, and he also asked me to finally call him Peter, but you can see that, that apparently didn't take. And at the time, it was fragments in a mini memo pad, observations of the people and things that made where I worked unique, but did not become poems until after I left for the Fresno Bee. While at the Bee, instead of making sales calls or typing up grocery copy for Louis Key Market, I found myself writing poems from those fragments of drug fare, losing myself in words and wondering what next. What happened next was Jackie Everwine started working at the B, and I thought to myself, no way, because at this point, I was in the process of applying for the MFA here at Fresno State, and I could reconnect with Peter vis-a-vis -vis his daughter-in-law. After confirming her relationship to Peter, I guess he was suspicious <laughs> somehow, <laughs> um, Gabe writes, I asked if she could pass along the message to Peter about assisting me with a letter of recommendation for the MFA application. She agreed and Peter contacted me by email asking me to send the manuscript I was considering submitting. Some time went by and I submitted my application and I was nervous about getting everything in on time and if Peter did send a letter on my behalf, so I met with Steve Yarbrough, then the director of the program, and I will never forget what he said to me. Quote, Peter speaks very highly of you and we take what he says very seriously. Needless to say, I was surprised to hear such praise from someone whose only encounter with me came at the pharmacy counter, where each sliver of a moment seemed so quick, a formality of, here is your prescription, sign here. But as I think back to the actual words spoken, like that of a cheese Peter once bought that, quote, smelled like God's feet would, <laughs> or just the sound of his voice saying, keep writing. I'm indebted to Mr. Everwine, not only for the time shared in the letter he wrote for me, but his believing in the potential of poetry and poets like me. Gabriel Ibarra. Call me Ollie. Peter Everwine was the best man at my wedding um, to Robert Mezzi. And um, uh, Robert, I want to thank um, uh, everyone who um, remembers uh, them both as brothers. So, Susan, I think that was wonderful that you mentioned that. He was a uh, 100% um, soulmate of Peter's in a way. So that was beautiful. I want you to join me in this kind of a prayer for Peter. Peter Everwine, we've taken your shadow and set it as a sail for our fragile boats. You tuned it to the North Star far out in a rough sea. Closer to shore, you came to us over waves of laughter and poetry. You forgive our blindness now and stand with us still as we bear witness to your merciful will. We ask that you take from our hearts our enduring love for you. 
just as you took in the nightingale song, the flickers and the whippoorwill, we'll listen for your call, low in the cottonwoods, high in the hardwood hills, and the softwood forests above the streams you fished. And we will know you are there in the pre-dawn light when we hear your crystalline call of the hermit thrush that tells us we are together again, all of us. This great circle of red flowers surrounding you, hundreds of us. And in the midst of us, you are, you speak. Keep singing to us, Pete. We will never stop loving you. My name is Lynn Johnson, and uh, I only got to know Pete uh, in the last few months. Um, I was a student here in the late 60s with Dave and Vic Healy and Bob Jarnigan, uh, all that, but, but I never actually met Pete or got to know him much at all. Um, and then uh, I became friends rather recently with Misha Langer, and uh, he invited my wife and I tomorrow uh, over to his house uh, for dinner, and uh, he had invited Pete. And so that's where we got to know him. And though we only had two or three dinners with him, I, it was amazing how, how enfolded, I guess, we felt um, at his personhood and his personality that was so accepting. Um, and uh, so we asked him, uh, you know, are you working on any poems now? And he says, yeah. Uh, and he pulls out a slip of paper and uh, this poem. And it sort of, uh, when, he, when he finished reading it, it was as though something had happened in the room. Uh, and um, at first we thought that the animal he was speaking about w w was referring to him, and then we realized that it referred to us. <laughs> and then we realized that it really kind of, like all good poetry does, really refers to, to everyone. So this is, uh, this is what he read for us. Elegy for a Gray Wolf. The gray wolf over the years had become demented, trotting from one corner of his cage to another without pause or rest. I used to visit him on quiet afternoons, drawn to his cage, yet appalled to bear witness to his blind, unbearable rush. I can't tell you if a wolf despairs or if an urgency of the spirit can howl in silence until it stuns the hammering heart into oblivion. But he lived among passerby, an exhibit and a curiosity. I speak here of a gray wolf, bewildered and lost in his own wilderness who ran as long and as far as he could before he reached that place from which he started and to which he had returned, still heading toward what he may have remembered. So I'd say there were half a dozen poems read here that I seriously thought of 
reading myself. They were too long, and I had my own criteria for choosing it. So I left out all of his poems that had the word dark in it, or darkens. <laughs> no, I'm talking about. It. Um, and I've known, I knew Peter for a lot of years, but I got acquainted in probably a little bit different, well, a lot different way than you did. He lived right around the corner from me. And when we moved here, my family and I moved here in 1974, he was one of the first people I met. I would, I had to, wanted to buy a house over in the old fig garden. My wife said, no, nah, we need to be over here in the neighborhood where our boys can find other kids to play with. I, eh, okay, so we did. But after meeting Peter, I realized she, made, she had the right <laughs> decision. Uh, he was an incredibly welcoming, loving man that you've all addressed, so I don't need to reiterate, um, but he made me feel at home. I had no idea who he was and how powerful a poet he was at that time. <clears throat> so probably within two weeks I met another man um, and I, within 10 minutes I knew who he was it was Chuck Moulton, so. <laughs> he was, they looked at him and I said, so are you a poet? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I thought, well, let's, let's put these two together here. Elegy for the poet, Charles Moulton. <laughs> you know, uh, what a, one other anecdote, though, is that as I've gotten older, I try to uh, strengthen my timeline a little bit, extend it. <laughs> and I think that this report that I read telling about one of those ways that you do it is by being friendly to your neighbors, which he was to me, and to Logan, who was the mail carrier, and to the lady down the street, and he knew the dog's name or the lady you'd walk around, you know, that kind of guy. No wonder he lived to 88, so I'm trying to copy that. <laughs> <clears throat> Elegy for the poet Charles Moulton. When we were last together, you read me your latest poem from a sheaf of hand-scrawled pages, dog-eared, and rolled together by a rubber band. You didn't ask me to look at it. We both knew why. I thought a catfish had a better grasp of English spelling. <laughs> you thought my soul had narrowed from too many years in the classroom. Yours was a freedom one might envy, listening to your drawl of gravelly music, that wild guffaw when a line pleased you. <laughs> I have a photo of you taken on some mountain, big grin, arms held out wide. You're dancing a jig, buck naked, in your broken boots. <laughs> and there's so much joy in your grizzled face, I have to turn away. You look like you're getting ready to fly. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Thanks, Peter, for everything you gave us. My name's Rob Hodges. I'm Catherine's husband, and I have a, a song for Peter that I'd like to sing. Uh, it's a parting glass. Oh, of all the money I had, I spent it in good company. And of all the harm I've ever done, alas, it was to none but me. And all that I've done for want of wit to memory now I cannot recall. So fill to me the parting glass. 
Good night and joy be to you all. Oh, if I had money enough to spend and leisure time to sit a while, there is a fair maid in this town that surely has me heart beguiled. Her rosy cheeks and ruby lips, I own she has me heart and throat. So fill to me the parting glass, Good night and joy be to you all. Oh, of all the comrades that I had, they are sorry for my going away. And of all the sweet hearts that I had, they'd wish me one more day to stay. But since it fell into my lot that I should arise and you should not, I gently rise and softly call. Good night and joy be to you all. Sounds like an ending, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you all for coming.